This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is Samuel Katz. He's the author of over 20 books on terrorism, and I first became aware of him back in 1997 when I was out on San Clemente Island for the third phase of BUDS. SEAL training, where we focus on land warfare, demolitions, firearms, and tactics. But one of the instructors talked about this book, The Night Raiders, and it highlights a raid by Flotilla 13, which is the Israeli equivalent of our U.S. Navy SEALs. And there's a raid on an island called Green Island. And the instructor went through this raid with us. And I immediately bought the book when I got back from the island and graduated buds. And I have been a student of Samuel Katz and his work ever since. His latest is called No Shadows in the Desert, uh, which focuses on Iraq, Syria, the Islamic State. Had a great conversation with him. And actually a couple of things that we talk about to include the raid on Green Island and Pan Am Flight 103 made it into the pages of my upcoming novel In the Blood, which has now changed from May 31st to May 17. So it's coming in hot a little bit early. But uh, now, without further ado, let's get into it. Samuel Katz. So I knew about you well before you knew about me. And uh, I found out about you. About me. What's that? Well, before I knew about me. (laughs) No, I don't think so. You've uh, you've been doing some amazing work for for a long time. And uh, it was this book, The Night Raiders, that uh, where I first became aware of you and we were out at third phase of buds. So, which is San Clemente Island, the land warfare phase. And where they say, no one can hear you scream out there. You're a little bit away from the flagpole. You're kind of your, your final test, uh, making sure you're really all it is, is making sure you're safe with demolitions and, and firearms. But uh, one of the instructors came in and sat us all down and talked to us about the raid on Green Island and referenced this book, which had just, I think, come out. Probably just came out in paperback. I'm not sure if it was out a year prior. It came in, out, I think, uh, in 1997. Okay, so 97 was the year. And that's when this one, that's, uh, I checked the date in here, just to be safe. So 1997 is when this uh, when this came out. And he walked us through the whole, uh, as you describe it in here, because it was recently declassified, I think. And he walked us through the entire operation that I went home, graduated BUDS, got the book, and I went through my own thing. I still have my notes in a box somewhere where I, off this description, I, I, I sketched everything out and put where everybody was and, you know, what weapons everyone was using and, and all that, just uh, because there weren't that many case studies uh, at the time with more, more modern over the beach type operations. And um, it was amazing. So thank you for writing this. Thank you for your kind words. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. So how did this all start out for you then? Um, and I want to start with, with where, where I usually end is, is letting people know where they can find you. But when they type your name into the, the search engine, a bunch of publisher things pop up. So it's like all the different publishers that you've had over the years with over 20 books. Is that right? Yes. Unfortunately, um, I'm old and been doing this for a very long time. So um, the quantity has, has increased and I hope the quality. Um, oh. I've been doing this full time since 1988. 1988. Uh, well, how did that start for you? How did that, uh, what was that journey like? Where did you grow up and where did you first kind of uh, get that, uh, the spark that told you, hey, my calling is to, is to explore, study, and write about terrorism related issues. Um, wh- where did that come from? How did you grow up? I grew up in um, Queens, New York. Um, I grew up in New York City um, in the my formative years were in the mid '70s, and New York resembled um, places like Yemen and um, and Fallujah during the surge. And which is funny because when I traveled around the world, and people have asked, "Are you nervous?" and I said, "I grew up in New York in the 1970s. Um, it, it's, it's okay." And I was always fascinated by military history, and I grew up in a home where um, my parents had escaped the Holocaust making their way to Palestine and later Israel. And it was always um, entrenched inside me that um, our freedoms, our our day-to-day life is charted by men and women who've sacrificed a hell of a lot. My uncle, 
um, who was in a concentration camp and made it before the war to the UK, um, ended up in the British Army. And um, going back to Western Europe after D-Day and fighting with British forces and um, using his native um, German with an Austrian dialect to interrogate um, captured um, soldiers. So I heard stories and um, it was always something of interest to me. And, and, and the history was always important. And I decided really kind of to focus on terrorism and counterterrorism really after Lockerbie, when um, the, the day of the plane being reported missing, I remember on the local news, there was a, a film crew that went to JFK airport where the parents of a lot of the Syracuse University students were waiting. And there was, um, I guess, the news that something had, had, had happened. They didn't say crash. They said there was an incident on the aircraft. And I remember one of the parents broke down in tears and there was a Port Authority cop, big burly Irish guy, who looked helpless. And that said to me something, that the evil of terrorism, the indiscriminate, catastrophic carnage of terrorism, really is something that here we're not accustomed to. And it's something that will become a central part of our existence. And um, sadly, I was correct. Wow. I mean, that was a formative event for, for me as well, as were a lot of the events that you and Fred Burton describe in, in Beirut Rules here, which is a fantastic book as well. Um, but uh, have you been back to the memorial at, at Syracuse for any of your uh, your research that they do every year and have the moment of silence at the, the time that the, the plane I went, went down? I, I, I have not been. Um, Seen the I've pictures been, probably. It's, it's something that I, I would like to do. And I think that um, um, I wrote a book that um, probably um, I, I don't think you've seen or it's, it was many years ago called Israel versus Jabril. Mm -hmm. And one of the perpetrators alleged of that crime um, has to have been, must have been, um, Ahmed Jabril of the PFL PGC, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command. Just reminding people, in the summer of 88, the USS Vincennes accidentally shot down an Iranian Airbus. It was during the Iran-Iraq War. U.S. forces in the Gulf were on heightened alert. There was an Exocet um, attack um, before that. Um, and this came on the radar. Um, a missile was, was launched and a passenger aircraft was shot down. The intelligence intercept was that the Iranians were willing to pay $20 million to bring down an American airliner. And Ahmed Jabril, who was a Palestinian terrorist who was operating out of Syria, was the, um, was the architect of the barometric bombs. He had blown up two aircraft in the 70s. He had tried several occasions to bring down El Al aircraft in the 70s. And he set a long notion of plan to, um, to blow up an American airliner. He needed the money. And German, West German, intelligence picked up that cell in Neuss in, in I think in October of 88. And um, it was called Operation Autumn Leaves. And in it, they found devices that were identical to the device that eventually was linked to the bombing of Pan Am 103. So the, the con consensus is among many in the intelligence community that when that cell was uncovered, that Jabril basically um, contracted it out. He contracted it out among the network of, um, of guys that terrorists operated and Libya came um, to the attention. Wow, I mean, well, how did you get to that, that point? Did you start your research into terrorism there or had you been studying it in school or on your own or what was I the have, I had spent quite a lot of time living in Israel. So it was something that I was aware of. I was, um, I was always fascinated by the, um, how Hollywood depicted terrorists as, um, as playboys and as adventurers. And were there anything but, they're just cold-blooded killers that adopt the cause because it's convenient. It explains what it is they do and why they do it. And Pan Am 103 was, um, was, was horrific on multiple level. 
but it was heartbreaking because the plan, the terrorist plan, didn't go according to plan, and the aircraft exploded over over Scotland. And as a result, there were clues, and there were artifacts, mm-hmm. and there were notes that kids had written to their parents, and um, family photos that were found in wallets. I mean, it was it was heartbreaking, heartbreaking. So all terrorist acts are heartbreaking, but this was on a mass scale, and mass carnage like that was something very new to terrorism. Mm. There had been um, mass carnage in places like Beirut, but that was distant. That was another world. Mm. Scotland was inching toward us, inching toward the Western way. And it was something that in the West, it was quite, we were quite unaccustomed to. Just, you know, I, I referenced Pan Am 103 in my latest novel, In the Blood, that's coming out May 17th. And interestingly enough, I referenced both 103 uh, and talk about that. And uh, this book, this, uh, the, the Green Island Raid uh, by Flotilla 13. So, um, so it, your, things that you have been intimately involved with are, are in there at least twice in that, in that Thank new you. novel. Um, but uh, so how did, so growing up that, that uh, the shadow of the Holocaust, uh, you know, looming over um, your family being so closely, uh, obviously connected to it, my gosh. How, so how did they, how did uh, your, your family, your, your parents and uncle, how, how did that, how did they get to the United States and then go back and forth to Israel? Like, how did that all, all transpire? Um, my parents, uh, my father was from Austria, my mother from Berlin. Um, they made it to Palestine, um, in, in late 39 before the war. Uh, my father illegally, my mother legally, she was um, young at the time. And um, living in Israel that was emerging into a state during the Second World War was difficult. Um, after it was more difficult. And my, my father wanted to reunite with his brother, who was the one they mentioned who was in the British Army. And the, um, the British wouldn't let my parents stay there legally unless they worked as domesticated servants and um, wouldn't live together. And this was something that obviously they didn't want. And um, especially from where they were, where they're, they all separated from their families and most families, they weren't willing to let go of one another. And my mother had a cousin who was also a Holocaust survivor who was living in Queens, New York. He sent them a ticket on the Queen Mary. Wow. My mother came to this country and found paradise. No kidding. And then you kept that connection to Israel and you, did you go back and grow up at certain, for a certain period of your, your childhood there? Or did you travel I, back I, and I forth? Went back, I went back for a while. Um, I married in Israel. Um, I speak fluent Hebrew. And I, um, I, I've done a lot of work, obviously, because um, being interested um, professionally in terrorism and also military history um, in terms of modern speak, that's, um, that's one hell of a place to be. I bet. I bet. And were you interested in journalism at all or, or writing or just terrorism? And then the, the, the books kind of sprouted from there or how, what was that, I, I that stage wanted, like? I always wanted to write. Um, and it kind of just, things happen. Um, I always say that life would have been much easier had I been an electrician or a plumber, but um, you can't unwind the clock and you can't change things. So I, I enjoy what I do. The publishing has changed. Um, the acceptance of history has, has changed. Um, it's, it's different, but like everything, if we either evolve or, or we're forgotten. So how did that first book come about then? Did you, did you uh, have an idea uh, and, and sell an idea to a publisher or an agent? Or how did the, how did the first book come about? And which, which book was it, by the way? I, I did some, some very old military um, short things for Osprey, um, okay. published in the UK. I had a friend who was a writer and he hooked me up. And then I did some, um, my first hardcover was a book for Presidio Press called Soldier Spies on Israeli military intelligence. I think that came out about 32 years ago. Wow. And then I decided that this is what I, I like doing. Um, it's, you learn as you go on. Um, I, 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 I've become a much better writer, I think, um, 
the older you get, the less energy you get. So you focus, <laughs> you, you focus whatever talent you may have um, into doing things properly as opposed to just turning them out. But I've, in the course of a career, I've, um, I've gone to um, some interesting places, met some interesting people, and um, I've got to see a part of the world that in many cases is denied to others. And yeah, I know it's fascinating in writing. I have a, I want to read a couple parts from, uh, from your latest book here. Cause they're, they're, it's so well-written and it's, it's something I think everybody, and it's a confusing part of the world too. I think that's part of that. Like we know Iraq, we know Afghanistan, but even though we had so much, uh, so many, well, inputs on what was going on in Iraq, Syria, uh, caliphates, ISIS, ISIL, Islamic State, Daesh, like all those different things were kind of confusing to people back here that are digesting their news as they're walking by, you know, the television, trying to get dinner made for the kids or whatever else they're doing. Um, so the way you explain it in this, it's a, it's, it should be the go-to book for people that are interested in that part of the world, which all of us should be because there are, there are lessons there that I want to ask you about later. But uh, before we get to that, when, uh, where were you on 9-11? I was in Queens at home working. I had, um, I had written two books on the NYPD's emergency service unit, um, a unit that um, changed my life in many ways, spending time being a fly in the wall um, in the police, the New York City Police Department, when the change from New York of old into New York um, of new, um, where it Crime was the war against crime um, was one um, was fascinating. Um, this was the 1994, 1995, 1996, and they always in, in quarters um, at the emergency service unit. Emergency service unit is split among ten different trucks or locations throughout the city, and um, they respond to um, job, smaller jobs in their locations and big jobs throughout the city. And everybody always spoke about the big job. You know, they went to plane crashes in, in the Hudson and in the East River. They did rescue work as well. They always spoke about that big, big job. And then lo and behold, one morning I was, uh, I was working and a friend of mine who was retired from the emergency service and he said, you gotta, you gotta put the TV on. And you know, within, within a short period of time, you realize that the world had changed. And indeed, the world had changed. Jeez. And so what do you do? What are you working on at that time? Are you working on something that had uh, any connections to uh, Al-Qaeda or, or terrorism? Uh, or are you working on something with the, the police department that, uh, at the time? What were, you, what were you studying or writing at the time? What I was doing, um, interestingly enough, um, I had, through the NYPD, I was introduced to the State Department's Diplomatic Security Service. And... An amazing group of men and women, yes, um, and who I always loved writing about people who have to work twice as hard for half the credit. Mm. And nobody ever heard of these people. And I think the only um, mention of them in literature up until that point was Tom Clancy killing them off <laughs> in, in a few books. And they were really ambassadors to the rest of the world. And in fact, they introduced me to a great many things around the world. And I had spent um, four, four years writing with them, working with them, writing articles and so forth. And I had finally found a, um, a publisher in August of um, 2001 who wanted to take on the story of how DS agents who were based at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan, captured Ramzi Yusuf. Mm -hmm. Again, it was after the first bombing of the World Trade Center, um, after uh, an aborted plan to blow up um, landmarks in New York City, and um, after a failed attempt in the Philippines by Ramsey Yusuf to assassinate the Pope, kill President Clinton, and blow up a dozen U.S. airliners over the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And in August of, of 2021, I was... Um, um, I, the book contract was signed. I had been in Israel where the Intifada had just begun with suicide bombings. And there was a big suicide bombing, a horrible one in the pizzeria in Jerusalem where 15 people were killed, nine from one family. And I came back to New York. I was kind of 
deconstructing all my notes. School had just started. I had two young kids in school. And I was working on the Ramsey Yusuf story. And lo and behold, the organization that he belonged to um, had that everyone thought kind of was gone or was no longer a major player, had emerged with the largest, most horrific terrorist attack in history. Jeez. Is that where you met uh, Fred Burton doing the, working on this, this book or working with uh, the DSS? Oh, Fred Burton, again, meeting him was a, was a game changer in my life. I met him at a command post in June 1996 when there was a mini UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, mm-hmm. and he was heading counterterrorism. And one of the individuals who um, was going to go in a follow car, I spent the day um, protecting the Cuban um, foreign minister with the DS agents. And they go, you got to meet this guy, Fred Burton. And Fred and I met and we hit it off. And how many books have you done with Fred now? Excuse me? How how many books have you done with Fred now? Two. And we're trying to get um, number three off the road. Um, I can't divulge the contents yes. yet. But, um, I, know, I know a little bit about it, but I won't tell anybody. But, okay. Um, but I didn't know that Ramsey Yusuf would not have been apprehended had Fred Burton not been in DS and not been in Washington and decided on his own to, um, to kind of not go through protocol and um, alert his superiors as had always gone in to give the agents who were in Pakistan the go-ahead. And as a result, Mr. Yusuf is no longer out there functioning. And um, in many ways, um, thousands of people um, were spared because his plan in, in the Philippines and for U.S. airliners in the Pacific was thwarted. Yep. No, it's amazing. I was actually in uh, Australia and New Zealand at the time and flying home. And I remember just seeing security change almost before my eyes and everybody going well while you're getting on your plane shoes off long lines not not security out here like we have today but as you're getting onto the planes everybody's shoes off everybody's bags unpacked every single thing gone through um that was really interesting of course i didn't know at the time what was going on i could surmise i was fairly young at the time but uh but i remember that that happening and then of course studying it a little bit later finding out what was uh, what was going on and studying it later into life and meeting fred and getting to talk to you and and uh and having terrorism obviously be a, a focal point of my life as well but uh i want to hop over to afghanistan then so uh the last 20 years obviously has given you a lot to work with uh in your your field your area of study um when you look back at the last 20 years in Afghanistan and uh, kind of take a take a strategic look at it holistically, what, what what lessons do you take from there? Do you think we should take strategically as a nation when we're dealing with some of these conflicts where our senior level military leaders uh, and uh, definitely our elected politicians, uh, elected representatives, uh, might not quite understand the nature of the conflict about that they're about to uh, commit American forces. Uh, and then we get 20 years of what we, we had. What, do you, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the, the last 20 years in Afghanistan? Um, in about 2014, the Israeli defense minister at the time, Moshe Yalon, who was the chief of staff of the, um, of the military, um, and the commander of Sayeret Matkal, which is the, um, the unit that took that, that um, was responsible for the Entebbe operation, called Secretary of State John Kerry messianic and naive. And I think the takeaway to answer your question is a certain naivety that we as a country are good at nation building. We're not. Um, there are parts of the world where we can't fix it. We can't solve their problems. We can try, but um, the road to hell is often paved with the best of intentions. And to think that we can change um, in five years, 10 years, trillions of dollars, things that are entrenched culturally, religiously, for thousands of years is a recipe for disaster. And it's tempting. It's tempting to be the president, the prime minister. Um, And this isn't only an American thing. Israel um, had the same experience when it tried to nation build in Lebanon um, after the 1982 innovation. It's imperative to kind of understand that 
um, in counterterrorism, in trying to remove a threat. Um, once you're invested in a country, you could be there for life. And you can't be. There are problems at home. Um, sometimes you, you give... Now, some people would say that if you give the enemy a different battlefield, he won't come to you. But the, um, the forever wars, the being invested in a place that we really don't have strategic interests in terms of resources, or that there isn't a cultural connection like Canada or Britain or the nations in the Five Eyes group mm -hmm. um, is risky. And often the risk is not um, worth the reward. Now, have there been, um, have there been an attack like 9-11 since? It would be an argument. No. Have there been other attacks? Yes. Has everything that we've done helped? to um, solve the world of terrorism? In, in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. It's, it's made the world just as unstable in some ways as it, is, as it was that morning in, in September 2001. Yeah. And, uh, yeah it, it, and you talk about it in here. I'm actually going to read a passage from it uh, talking about how, uh, in some cases, we are creating more terrorists uh, through some of our actions than would have been created otherwise. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one to, it's a tough one to balance, certainly, especially we're on the battlefield and you have a mission to remove these guys from it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, especially when you're looking at the, the, the kids and wives and aunts and uncles of the people that you take remove, uh, thinking about what they're going to do in the next five, 10 years, 20 years, uh, how that is yeah, how that's affecting them. I mean, the the mandate to eradicate Al-Qaeda after 9-11 is crystal clear. The mandate to make the world um, a place that didn't have a Saddam Hussein was clear. But um, sometimes when you remove one thing, um, you unleash something that in many ways is worse. Yeah. And so when you, uh, in the lead up to Iraq, what were your thoughts on the, the lead up to Iraq and the, the intelligence there, having studied uh, intelligence and targeting, particularly when we're, you're, you're top focused on, on Israel for a lot of your, your research. Um, but when you look at that, uh, the intel we had going into Iraq, the reasons we had to go into Iraq, the reasons we stayed in Iraq for so long, um, then, uh, and then some of the decisions we made along the way, like disbanding the Iraqi army, debathification, um, and those sorts of things. What did, were you shaking your head at some of those, or were you uh, supportive of a lot of that? Or what were your thoughts on uh, the initial invasion and then the, the next years and how that developed? I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not a genius. So I'm not going to say I knew all along it would end not well. Um, everyone wanted Saddam gone, and clearly, um, Politically, this was a time to do something. Was it the right thing? No one knows. Was it, wasn't it um, former um, Secretary of State Alexander Haig said of, during the Iran Iraq War, it's a pity that one side has to win? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> these were nation, he was a leader who was clearly. Um, a problem. Clearly, he threatened his neighbors, and clearly, he was up to no good. Was he connected to 9/11 and weapons of mass destruction? Still, as the as many of the accounts go, I think I think that was the the beginning of the politicization of kind of how our policies are run when it comes to really dire decisions of, of life and death. Uh, the example that you could kind of have um, for maybe reasons not to do this were, um, as I mentioned before, Israel and Lebanon in 1982. The um, Palestinian terrorists had really become a threat. Israel invaded. Um, then Defense Minister Ariel Sharon um, and the Israeli intelligence community wanted to, um, to use that invasion as a pretext to install um, Christian pro-Israel militia leader Bashir Jamal as president. 
And initially, the Palestinians were not welcomed by the local residents of southern Lebanon, the Shiites, when the Israeli tanks rolled in in June of 82, they were greeted as liberated. Mm. But um, Monday morning's liberator becomes Tuesday morning's occupier. The people didn't want them out. And when the Syrians assassinated Bashir Jamal, and all hell break, broke loose, um, not only did international peacekeepers have to come in, not only did the Christians exact their own biblical revenge with the sovereign Chitila massacres, which, uh, which created an even greater political crisis. But they gave Iran at the time an opening to um, use the Shiite rage that had been brewing for many years as a pretext for launching something that was much worse than the Palestinians ever were in Southern Lebanon. Jeez. So I think there's, there's some lessons that we can learn uh, from, from Israel's history. Um, just because there is so much of it from 1947 up to today in particular, when we talk about uh, dealing with with enemies of the state, uh, in that case, in very close proximity. Um, in our case, maybe some that are within our borders, but let's go back to 2001 or before that are that are outside in many cases. Um, and, uh, and using, you know, of course, we've used... Uh, uh, you know, missiles to target people in Sudan and Afghanistan before before that, Libya, of course, air raids, that sort of thing. But uh, the way Israel has dealt with some of their uh, the people they wanted removed from the battlefield in Iran in particular, some uh, scientists working on weapon systems and those sorts of things where you know, everybody points to an Israeli intelligence service with maybe some help from the CIA. They like to throw put those two together and, you know, uh, both services kind of have no comment um, on it. And I think back to to uh, 2003 in Iraq, if maybe there were some things that uh, that could have been done uh, more surreptitiously to uh, to remove Saddam from power, um, and uh, and you, then you know you never know who's coming up in his stead. Uh, it probably would have meant a few more people would have to have been removed as well, uh, particularly his sons. But uh, there's some lessons I think we can learn from Israel if uh, if we really take a hard look at that history, uh, successes and failures, and really put some deep thought into it. But I really think we're missing the deep thought part uh, in a lot of our strategic level thinking or the ones that actually translate over into policy. Um, you know, we elect these leaders to for, for a certain reason. They represent us. Uh, we trust our senior military leaders, leaders, our senior level intelligence officials. Some of them are appointed. Some of them are politically appointed. And what ends up out of all that mix, I think, is you get people that don't necessarily uh, understand the nature of this conflict. They uh, they don't understand the second and third order effects of some of their decisions because they seem to be more focused on uh, on the politics than uh, than the actual end game, um, which should be to protect the American people. But. Um, yeah, that's so why I encourage everybody to dive into your books, dive into history, so we know how some of these things, how we got to some of the places that we're we're in. Uh, and I'd encourage kids, especially this next generation, get into the pages of books. But I'm not that hopeful because there are so many distractions these days that I didn't have growing up, that you didn't have growing up. You had to read, I had to read if we were interested in something. We had to put in that effort, and uh, we had to make an effort to read. We had to go to the mm -hmm. library. Yep, exactly we had to go right. To the instead of just clicking the mouse it's 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 become it's become very difficult because um the news because of, there's so much of it it's diluted yeah. and the notion of of studying a place understanding individuals is is difficult and the the world out there it, it runs on so many different frequencies and sometimes frequencies that we find foreign, we find funny, we find abhorrent, but it's their frequencies. And I think the idea that we can sort of change things um, is, is noble. But in, in the real world, in the real world that's ugly and violent and takes no prisoners, mm -hmm. it's foolish. Yeah. And it seems to me that uh, a lot of your your books gave you such a great foundation uh, with which to do to do what you're doing now. So for your latest book, like all these books that you read you wrote over the years um, gave you such a great foundation from which to build upon. Um, which is why I'm such a, a huge fan. They're so insightful. Um, can you talk a little bit about Sarah McCall? I mean, 
how did you get the, these insights? And there's some of it was out there, obviously, like the Radon and Tebby and that sort of a thing. But uh, can you talk about them and where they came from and uh, a couple of those those highlights that uh, that you talk about in the elite? All of Israel's special operations units um, emerged out of having um, a small group of people um, trying to survive in a very small piece of land surrounded um, by um, overwhelming enemies who had much greater resources than you. So you had to um, rely on wit and um, a certain arrogance. In Hebrew, is known as chutzpah. You know, chutzpah is the Americanized version of, of the word. Is. And this was evident in Israel's pre-independence um, special operations units, and it's evident in, in all of the units that, that followed. Most of the units in Israel, including Sayer and Makal, the special units, emerged out of tragedies and mistakes. And I think that that's an important thing to take away that um, Israel was able to learn lessons and apply those lessons from bad things that happened in the battlefield. Sayyid Makal was formed as an intelligence gathering force that could go deep behind enemy lines and learn about the enemy. Intelligence being one of the um, assets that Israel um, invested greatly in. And that emerged out of an incident where a young um, soldier who was putting a battery in an eavesdropping post in Syria was captured and tortured. And then when his body was returned, they found a note in the clothing that says, uh, that said in Hebrew, I did not betray my country. And re relying on, on paratroopers, as good as soldiers as they were, or infantrymen to do very specialized work, daring work, required a special breed of individual. And Sayyid Matkal, which means is, is the um, um, General Staff Reconnaissance Unit, was such a unit. They became um, counter-terrorist specialists um, by chance. In May of 1972, um, Black September terrorists, two men, two women, hijacked the Sabina Belgian Airlines um, to Israel. And they demanded the release of hundreds of prisoners around the world. And Sayyid Makal was called upon to end the incident. And the unit commander at the time was a lieutenant colonel named Ehud Barak, who in himself was someone that the unit was sort of built around. And Ehud Barak um, came up with a plan that he would disguise, Israel would agree to all the terrorist demands. They would ready the flight for takeoff. And his commandos were dressed in white fatigues, white overalls to look like air, airline mechanics, and they stormed the aircraft. Interestingly enough, one of the lieutenants that stormed the aircraft was a man named Benjamin Netanyahu. Amazing. Benjamin Netanyahu's older brother, Jonathan Netanyahu, Yoni, was a captain in the unit. The, um, the lesson kind of um, that I'm getting at is that Israel, Israel's leaders don't necessarily use um, the Ivy League or trust funds as incubators for greatness. They use the military. And they have produced some, some specialized units that um, were, were created to correct mistakes and glaring holes in Israel's capabilities that were illustrated by past events. So the Night Raiders, for example, Flotilla 13, Flotilla 13 came very close to being disbanded um, after the Six-Day War. All the services in, in the Israel Defense Forces, the Navy was the one that failed in the Six-Day War. And six frogmen were killed or captured um, trying to mine Egyptian vessels in the early part of the war. And they gave command of the unit to a lieutenant colonel, and they said, you know, what can you do with him? He was a no-nonsense guy named Zev Almov, and he turned the place upside down. One of his first visits as commander of the unit was he visited the SEALs. And the SEALs had some combat experience, not just underwater demolition in Vietnam. And some of the ideas were taken 
um, back to Israel. And also, um, Zebomog invested heavily in technological means, um, underwater craft tools that could help them. And the end result was Green Island. And um, during the war of attrition that kind of was in between the Six Day War and the 73 War, um, that was in itself a Aberdeen testing ground of special operation. Mm. Counter-terrorist raids. It was it wasn't full, full-blown conventional combat. Like in a in the Six Day War before that, in the Yom Kippur War after that, it was a, an incubator of ideas and, and tactics. There were raids during that conflict that are mind-boggling. The Israelis flew into deep into Egypt and stole an advanced Soviet radar, and that radar eventually helped um, when the information from the radar was passed. That information helped. U.S. Um, air sorties over the Vietnam because the v- North Vietnamese were using the exact same radar. Oh wow! I mean, it's so fascinating. The history of Israel is so fascinating to me, and this is my my latest book is one where I get to really explore that for the first time. It's always been something I wanted to get to, but it just didn't make sense to try to force it into any of the other books. So, uh, and I went to go there. I really want. Well, first off, I always missed our exchange program with Flotilla 13 um, because I was always in Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere else. And uh, so I never got to, to do that. So my one regret of being in the military, the thing that I didn't get to do that I would have loved to have done uh, was to, to go there and see how they run their training in their hell week. That's mostly what our exchanges were about, the different things that they were using. Like we've had the LAR-5 rebreather system since I don't know when, the beginning of time, it seems like. Um, but uh, Flotilla 13, from what I understand, has different rebreathers for different missions, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so I really wanted to go there and see all that, but I never, never got to. And for this book, I really wanted to go to Israel. I had, cause I put boots on the ground in Russia for uh, the third book. I went to Mozambique for the second one, uh, South Africa to help train up an anti-poaching unit for the second and third ones. Um, but uh, I really wanted to go to Israel for this one, but the COVID protocols that kept changing and it was open and it was closed and it was just so confusing. And as a, uh, obviously as a non-Israeli citizen, I couldn't, uh, it was just too hard to get in there with the changing rules and protocols and everything else closed open and all that. They changed so, the rules sometimes overnight. Yes. It was, it was chaotic. <laughs> yes. So, uh, point being, I didn't get to go there, but I did send the manuscript just the uh, last week to, uh, to a friend in Israel and he had his whole family read it. And they've been there since, uh, since the beginning and his grandmother is 103 years old. And, and, uh, uh he says one of my biggest fans. So I sent it and they, the whole family read it and they all said that they couldn't believe that I hadn't been there with what I, I, awesome. what I wrote. So that made me feel pretty, pretty good about it, but I need to, I need to, to get there. Um, but, uh, the, the green Island raid, can you talk a little bit about that flotilla 13 and what that was, uh, what that was all about and why that was uh, so significant? Well, one of the elements of the, um, of the war of attrition was the, the introduction of, um, Soviet, anti-aircraft capabilities because it was the Israelis wanted to mainly keep it in air war. Mm. Israeli forces were on the Suez Canal and on the Golan Heights. And the Arab armies, having suffered the defeat of 1967, weren't quite at a um, stage where they could um, go on the offensive and try and, and retake those territories. Um, but they could make Israel bleed. Mm. And that in many ways has been one of the strategies. And adding to that was that they were client states of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union wasn't very happy that all of their MiGs and Sukhois ended up um, twisted um, heaps of metal. And their tanks proved no match for the British and American tanks that the Israelis were using. And that every element of the Soviet doctrine collapsed. Mm. And Missiles were introduced, anti-aircraft guns were introduced, and Green Island was one of these, these little coral um, pop-ups in the, um, you know, off the coast of the southern coast of Sinai, and um, that, that separated two countries, and it was interfering with Israeli air tactics. And the Israelis um, decided that they were going to take it out, they were going to destroy it. And one of the things I learned in doing the book, especially in the book um, that I wrote, The Ghost Warriors on the Undercover Unit, was that when there's an operation, um, the, the units, the various special operation units, um, all want to have a piece of it. They all want to make sure 
but they're the ones. Yeah. And they have, you know, they put up plant now that now it's PowerPoint and slick <laughs> yeah, open media presentations. But at the time, these were things that, that were written out with maps and reports. And, and the Navy was dead. the Navy needed work. So they had to recover from the poor showing in the 67 war. Mm. And it was decided that um, you know, they were gonna, you know, they were determined that they were gonna take Green Island. And they did. It was defended by a garrison of the Egyptian Special Forces. Um, it was a tough nut. The fighting was um, was something out of Hollywood, something that um, training officers in naval special warfare units could only dream of. And the raid was ultimately successful. And in many ways, it put the unit on the map. Yeah. And when a unit's on the map, you know, the, um, the problem with the world that, um, that you live in is sort of catch-22. The unit's secret. And a lot of times people, even inside the military, don't know exactly what to do. So everyone's protective of their rice bowl. Well, why should I give resources to the SEALs? I don't know what they do. Right. Political people don't say, I don't, I don't know what they do. So sometimes not having publicity is a good thing because operational security is, is paramount. Not having um, publicity is bad because nobody knows what you do and nobody knows what your capabilities are. So for multiple reasons, Green Island was a turning point for the union. A turning point that established itself as the premier um, assault unit that had naval capability and one that once you once you carry out a mission like that, you only want bigger things. Mm. And, and indeed, during that war, they were incredibly busy as all the Israeli special operation units. Um, in, interesting enough, the, um, that operation um, happened on the night that Neil Armstrong um, planted his feet on the moon. Wow. So it, it, it was a historic date, but it's an operation that's studied. The individuals who took part in that um, are a unique breed. And, and one of the things that, that fascinates me about special operations is that um, it's a different breed of human being on many levels, intelligence, um, um, stamina, um, physical power, endurance, um, durability, um, and the ability to keep a cool head and the world around you is coming apart. And that in itself is a force multiplier. But the, the pressure of that is enormous because when you're operating on such a small scale with such enormous stakes, the margin for error is non existent. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, incredible. And, uh, you know, I went back to this book recently because I was uh, in writing the, this. I was like, man, what weapons did they use coming across? It had been a while since I since I read this. And uh, so I was like, what weapons did they use coming across the beach? Because I have a Galil in this next novel. And I try to have the the uh, the weapons in my books develop the characters, almost be characters in and of themselves. Uh, and I remember that one of the instructors had a Galil and talked to us about it. But uh, but I went back, I'm like, did they actually use them in this raid? And I went back, I'm like, no, Uzis and AK. So they didn't really use that. But uh, but still the connection in my mind, because of the time frame where I learned about this raid, when this book came out, and that instructor showed us a Galil back in the day, um, were connected in my mind. So I went back to this to check. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the um, Operation Spring of Youth uh, and who they who they were after and and, uh, and what happened on that mission? So for Israel, the Munich Olympic Massacre was the 9-11 of their day. In many ways, it was the um, touchstone event in terrorism because it was televised. The organization that carried out Black September, uh, that carried out the Munich Olympic attack was Black September. Black September emerged out of the Jordanian Civil War in, the, in September 1970 when Palestinian groups had taken over Jordan. And on one, um, one day in September, four Western airliners were hijacked. Two Jordan, those were the days when they hijacked air, air, aircraft and didn't blow them up with everybody mm -hmm. on it. 
And one of the aircraft, a British aircraft, was blown, or two of them were blown up at a remote air, airfield in, in Jordan near Oman with all the passengers off. And it was a symbol to King Hussein that um, he was losing his country. And a civil war erupted. And the fighting between the Palestinians and the Jordanians was brutal, absolutely brutal, vicious. Um, thousands were killed. And the day before CNN and the 24 7 news cycle could cover events like that. And the Jordanians really put down um, the Palestinian presence and they forced the Palestinians to move to Lebanon. And out of that, Arafat created his own special operations unit, a deniable force that could really um, change the paradigm of what Palestinian terrorism would be. And they call that group the Black September Organization. I don't, I don't, the, the month was called Black September because Arab, Arabs were killing Arabs. Their first operation was the assassination of a Jordanian prime minister in Cairo. They shot him as he was leaving an Arab League summit. And then the perpetrator got on his knees and licked up his blood because he wanted the world to know that these people were on a level beyond what people had become accustomed to. Their next operation, major one, was the hijacking to Israel that Ehud Barak and Netanyahu stormed the aircraft and rescued the hostages. And the Munich Olympic massacre was their, their large operation. And the murder of Jews in Germany. Um, so close after the end of the Second World War with all the symbolism that it involved the, um, the failure of West German police to do anything about it, um, really sparked something inside Prime Minister Golda Meir. And she instructed the Mossad, military intelligence and the Special Operations Unit to put Black September inside the crosshairs and to eradicate the, the operation, the organization. And Mossad hit teams, as has been made famous in, in books and in Steven Spielberg's movie Munich, roamed to Europe and elsewhere looking for these individuals, and they assassinated them. And three of the top leaders of Black September lived in Beirut. And in April 1973, um, a combined force of Israeli intelligence agents, Sayeret Matkal, um, recon paratroopers and naval commandos, were flown into Lebanon, and they took out three leaders of Black September in their apartments in Beirut. They blew up factories, and they more or less destroyed that organization. What's interesting about the operation is, um, and it was in the Steven Spielberg film, I'll give them credit for that, um, the Sayeret Matkal operators, Ehud Barak, um, among them, dressed in drag to, um, to get by a... Um, a guard that was in front of the building that could have um, had an engagement begun then could have tipped everybody off, which was quite remarkable, um, considering that um, Ehud Barak dressed as a woman, even in his younger days, might have not been the, the greatest sight um, imaginable. <laughs> but it shows a level of daring and creativity that the Israelis have become very, very good at. Yeah, no, it's, there's so many lessons uh, from from all of those uh, those operations uh, that, that obviously we we studied, and you know we have a couple of flashpoints in uh, in U.S. history. Desert One, we have lessons that still looms large, obviously, in special operations planning um, uh, with Mogadishu, Panama, Grenada, those touch points. But Israel, it seems, has was engaged in this sort of conflict from its earliest days, from its inception through today. There has been no rest, at least from somebody looking at it from the outside, uh, where we had these years before certain flashpoints here and there. Uh, and we chose to ignore, ignore a lot of warnings, of course, and not take certain lessons. But, um, but it's fascinating that, uh, that Israel has been especially engaged in special operations type of, uh, of warfare from its inception. So there's so many lessons. From the days before independence. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, Yamas. Is that how you say it? Or Yaman? How, how, Yamas. Yamas. In, uh, in Ghost Warriors, you talked about them. Um, you know, it, Obviously, people who live in Israel are more familiar with them than people in the United States. But uh, can you talk about them and talk about Ghost Warriors a little bit and what their, uh, what their mandate is and how they operate? The um, Israelis have been masquerading as Arabs since before the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, 
primarily for intelligence purposes. To and since a lot of Israelis from the diaspora came from Arab countries, um, it was fairly easy. The language was native. Um, Israel has an advantage in the intelligence arena is that it's a land of immigrants. So you have people from all walks of life, all colors, all, um, all dialects, all languages. In, um, in the first intifada, the army created a unit called Duv Devan, which was Hebrew for cherry, which was created by an innovative officer. And the unit's mission was to infiltrate um, Arab protests and, and sort of um, emerge at the last minute showing their identification and arrest the ringleader, thinking that if you arrest the ringleaders, um, everyone else will be leaderless, rudderless, and will be easier to handle. The intifada of rock throwing and Molotov cocktails being thrown emerging um, became a shooting war, and Duz Devan became um, very active. And they used very innovative tactics, um, sometimes masquerading. Um, they, they dressed their individuals as old men, as women. Um, on one occasion um, that I write about in the book, the, the unit um, masqueraded as an ABC film crew because they had a few um, English speakers. Um, Rune Arledge, who was president of ABC News at the time, went ballistic. And um, he said that why they is really using ABC. Um, but when I interviewed the commander of Dudavan at the time, the founder of the unit, he said, well, um, we, bought a, we bought stencils and A, B, C. <laughs> yeah. So there was no malice um, against the, the network. Um, the Border Guard, which is the gendarmerie, the paramilitary police arm of the Israeli National Police, um, that operated in the West Bank and in Gaza, was very active in counterterrorism, and they were also, they had a lot of Arabic speakers. Um, they attracted Israeli citizens who were Bedouins, um, Druze, and Circassians. So they had native Arabic speakers, mm -hmm. and they decided to create their own unit. Yamas is a Hebrew acronym for Yusidat Mistalavim, or undercover people who masquerade as Arabs. And the unit developed very unique tactics, very unique capabilities um, in fighting terrorists by getting, getting, to the, getting so close inside where they operated in their safe havens by becoming them and becoming indistinguishable realities of the terrain that the terrorists had to invest enormous time and effort to avoid what could be suspicious rather than planning to attack. Mm. There um, became three undercover units um, that the border guard had, one for the West Bank, one for Jerusalem, and one for Gaza. And the units operated um, daily in very daring small operations. Um, the current Israeli police commissioner, um, Yaakov Shaktai, is um, merged from the um, Gaza unit. Um, and in 2000, Intifada starts and all hell breaks loose. And no longer are the terrorists um, content with um, just shooting up targets or taking hostages. Terrorists now blow themselves up. And Hamas and the Islamic Jihad have become a, the major player, the major terror organization. The Palestinian Authority exists. There are rules and regulations on where you can operate. And the Israelis needed some something, an entity that could um, carry out what's known in the business in Hebrew, at least, as tweezer operations. You go in, pluck it out, and you move on. And the undercover units were ideal for for these operations. Now, in um, just to refresh um, history, in the summer of 2000, there was a Camp David summit when President Clinton hosts Ehud Barak, <coughs> excuse me, who was Prime Minister and Yasser Arafat. And everyone thinks that the deal of the century will finally be struck. Peace in, in totality will exist among the Palestinians. And um, there was talk of even disbanding the undercover unit. 
In October, though, um, the Intifada begins. Mm -hmm. And like all conflicts, they escalate. It goes from tire burning and protests to rock throwing to shooting attacks. And in June of 2001, there is a suicide bombing in, in Tel Aviv of a disco, in which a young West Bank terrorist kills um, um, 20 um, Israeli teenagers. A month later, there's the, um, a month and a half later, there's a bombing of the pizzeria in Jerusalem. 9-11 happens. The Palestinians have to up their game because now they're competing for the, for the international network coverage of atrocities, mm. Al-Qaeda. And the suicide bombings become more horrific, more widespread. And it reaches a point where you have almost weekly um, incidents of buses being blown up. And Israel's at war. And the undercover units, the three undercover units that I write about, played an integral part in eliminating hundreds of terrorists, terrorist commanders, um, where they lived, where they operated, before they could come in and attack targets in Israel, before they could kill civilians. And that lesson of, of Arab speaking, of, of cultural immersion, is something that is an important takeaway from the book. Because these units, many, many of the people inside the units are native Arabic speakers, many of them are Muslim. But the cultural research, the cultural immersion, and also the cultural respect is enormous. It's the undercover units have been um, criticized and vilified by um, groups like Amnesty International and human rights groups as hit teams. Um, and there's just, oh, oh, their sole mission is to kill Arabs. In reality, the opposite is true. These are individuals that have studied Arab culture and Arab um, song, and, um, and they've studied the language. They respect it. They live it. And they are, in many ways, the greatest scholars of the culture, um, far more than people who have emerged from universities because they understand the good, the bad, and the ugly, because they mm. see it operational. Well, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. There's that. I mean, what's, what's the TV show that's out now that's on, uh, is it on Netflix? Fauda. Yeah, Fauda. I need to watch that. I've been, I, I've been so busy the last few years, I haven't had a chance to sit down and watch it. Um, did, uh, what do you think of that? And then, isn't the creator I of that? I haven't watched it. You haven't watched it either? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I haven't busy watched writing. it. A, friend, a very good friend of mine who emerged from the army unit, only to go on to command um, one of the undercover units. Um, was saying, yeah, yeah, I know some of those operations, but it's TV, it's not real. Yeah. And um, I think sometimes when you see the real thing, um, I had the privilege of going on operations with them. Um, TV can never do it justice. Yeah. No, it's, man, it's, it's incredible. Um, now, I want to talk about your latest book as well. I mean, there's so much that you've, you've done and written and uh, I use it in my, my research, but, uh, but this latest one is probably the, the most, I mean, they're all timely, even though the things were written 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, in some cases, I mean, it gives us a foundation to understand uh, what's happening, happening today, which is why I recommend them all. But this is the, uh, the latest one, no shadows in the desert. Um, and can you talk about the Jordanian, uh, the GID for a little bit, which you, you uh, referenced quite a bit in, uh, in this book? The um, GID is the um, CIA or Mossad of Jordan. And um, the, Jordan is a very unique country in that it's at the center of a very bad neighborhood. You have um, Israel and the Palestinians to the west. You have Syria and Iraq to the north. You have Saudi Arabia to the south and east. Um, everything that's bad, that could be bad in the Middle East, everything nefarious, all kind of ends up in Jordan. Mm. So Jordan, because it doesn't have oil, it doesn't have vast natural resources, what they invested heavily in is mining intelligence out of its people. Mm. And because the tribal element of the Middle East is so strong, and tribes that are in Jordan are also strong in Iraq and elsewhere, remember that the Middle East was carved on a map by British and French um, individuals after the um, the end of the First World War, um, they have ties to 
individuals in Iraq and elsewhere. And because they don't have the te technological capabilities of the CIA or their Israeli neighbors, they've invested heavily in human intelligence. And when the war against ISIS began, um, and ISIS moved rapidly across into Syria, and Jordan was going to be next. And King Abdullah was one of the first to join the international coalition that emerged. And the GID, the General Intelligence Department, because of its connections, were, became um, the CIA's eyes and ears on the ground. And for whatever you can say about signal intelligence and electronic intelligence and satellite intelligence, being on the ground, talking to somebody, looking at things with your own eyes, um, seeing the nuances of body language are um, replaceable. And there the Jordanians were masters. And the book, which um, came out, unfortunately, at the height of COVID, so um, nobody ever heard of it, <laughs> but the book um, is about in a Jordanian F-16 pilot who was forced to ditch his aircraft after a bombing Saudi in Raqqa, was captured by ISIS, beaten and tortured. And then in February of 2015, ISIS released a video of him being burnt alive. And this was a video that shocked the world, and which was the reason why ISIS had made it. And it presented a grave challenge to King Abdullah. So we talked about Black September and the Jordanian Civil War years earlier, the Palestinians posed an existential threat to Jordan's sovereignty. And here, um, ISIS posed that threat because the immolation of the pilot threatened to undermine the king's ability to rule because if they did nothing, if Jordan did nothing, um, it would provoke those who were sympathetic to ISIS in the country to rise up. So the king instructed his intelligence service, find those individuals and make sure that they're dead. And for the next three years, um, one of the priorities of the GID was to locate the individuals that handled the pilot, ruled that he be executed in such a barbaric fashion and were responsible for the event. And because the coalition to, um, to take out ISIS with global, the, the whole infrastructure of eradication of the terrorist hierarchy became a multinational affair. The Jordanians with eyes on the ground, the Americans and the Allies with aircraft based all over the Middle East. And that campaign to take out the heads of the snake um, ultimately was credited by many in the Middle East with expediting the, demise, the military demise of ISIS. Yeah, no, you and you start the book, interestingly enough, with the uh, the Delta Force ready to capture or kill, uh, ended up, he killed himself with an S vest, but Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in October of 2019. Uh, and interestingly enough, just last week, uh, as of this recording, anyway, uh, the person who took over for him, uh, along with his top lieutenant, were killed in a very similar raid. Um, and the person who took over for him also detonated a suicide vest, killing a wife, children, um, just like uh, just like uh, my daddy did in, in 2019. So, and that was on the anniversary of the release of the um, ISIS video of the um, pilot being burnt alive. Wow. What was that, February 3rd? Is that the? Yes. Amazing. Incredible. What's interesting to me is that uh, both of those two people detonated these S vests, S belts, um, whatever they, they were, killing wife, children, innocents. Uh, and then you have Osama bin Laden, uh, who has an AK in his room, in his compound in Pakistan. There are shots fired. They're not suppressed uh, as part of that raid as, uh, as the operators are, are moving in and working their way up the stairwell. Um, people died defending him. He obviously sent people to their deaths uh, for a long number of years. And in the end, he did not grab that AK, did not grab that Kalashnikov and defend himself or his family. Uh, he didn't detonate an S-Vest, but he did not grab that weapon that was within arm's reach either. So it was, it was interesting to me just the difference between these two guys, between al Baghdadi and his predecessor and, uh, and bin Laden. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. 
I think that the higher you go up with the food chain, um, in many cases, first of all, I don't think that bin Laden ever expected that there'd be knocks on the door um, and they wouldn't be the, um, the Uber Eats guy from, from, you know, from the local um, shawarma place. I think he thought he was well protected because nobody had come to him um, previously. We don't know yet if the vests that um, were detonated on Baghdadi and the others um, were self-detonated or maybe remote. Mm. The, um, I, I know that from a lot of the um, incidents in Israel, the terrorists um, who were so eager to send men and women to their deaths with um, devices strapped to their bodies um, are the first ones to raise their hand and surrender. Mm. The, the notion of martyrdom is good when it's somebody else. <laughs> That's a great line. And that is a fantastic line. I'm going to write that down, actually. Write it down. The, um, I, I think a way to, think, to look at this is that terrorism in many ways is a business for these people. Mm-hmm. And um, the bosses want to live the good life. Um, you know, in the world of terrorism, there's money. There's power. These are all very attractive um, um, commodities for bosses, for their families, and it trickles down like any organized crime entity. Terrorism is a criminal enterprise. Um, the, ideolo- the ideology and the religious part are components of it, mm. but it's all about money and power and, and yielding your. Um, your weapon and, you know, and, and getting what you want. And I think that um, moving forward, um, maybe one of the weapons, um, and, and I think that it's becoming part of the military operational guideline, is making them poor. What's the line from the movie Trading Places? The best way to get even with rich people is to make them poor. Um, the Israelis started doing that years ago when they began targeting um, the money. Is that Harpoon? Is that what you write about in Harpoon? Yes. That's the one I haven't read. I need to. Uh, I just ordered it though before I jumped on uh, on this podcast. Um, Mayor Dagan, who was the head of the Mossad, he had learned that in the West Bank that there was money flowing in. Mm. Um, the terrorist groups were building schools and hospitals and markets and employing people, and all of a sudden Mercedes were popping up, and and kids were going to schools overseas. And where's the money coming from? And the money was coming in from places like the Gulf. And, and Iran, and the same thing for Al-Qaeda, the same thing for ISIS, and the same thing for every other terrorist group. Um, you know, would the 9-11 hijackers have been able um, to carry out their attack if they couldn't afford flying lessons, if they couldn't afford all of this? Funding the money element of terrorism is integral to um, everything. And I think when we look at in the future, hopefully um, much less than in, in the past, that we, we take a more holistic approach and, and take different um, pillars of their fortress and dismantle them simultaneously as opposed to kind of doing military that money. Um, it, it's, it's important to um, take away the perks of what being um, on the most wanted list and, mm. and having safe houses and all that um, you know, comprise. Oh, I'm interested. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to reading uh, reading that that harpoon. I hadn't. Uh, I'm really looking forward to reading that. Should be here in a, a few days. But uh, can you talk about who uh, Abu Omar Al Shinsani was? Um, and I think I have something I wanted to, to read about that because the writing in this is uh, aside from what you're what you're talking about um, is just it's so so well done. I mean, I mean, I love this. Sixteen top Islamic State field commanders greeted Abu Omar al Shisani as he walked toward a darkened staircase in the cellar of a two-story home that was large enough for at least three families. The men looked tired, but they had become energized to see al Shisani and his phalanx of bodyguards. A highly detailed map was spread across a large dining room table. Smaller maps were spread across chairs and draped on the wall. Small fluorescent light bulbs illuminated the room. The air inside was stifling with cigarette smoke. A fan buzzed as it twirled a steady rotation and blew a slight breeze of air inside a room that was crowded and stifling. 
the lieutenants parked their Toyota Land Cruisers far away from the house so that satellites and drones wouldn't be able to pinpoint exactly where the high-level gathering was taking place. The American combat aircraft approached from the east, from the rising sun, and through the established corridor of the attack against the Islamic State. The aircraft snuck in completely by surprise and were not subjected to anti-aircraft fire. The 500-pound precision bombs that were launched against the building hit at dawn's first light. The destruction of the two-story structure was absolute. All that was left of the building was a 45-meter deep smoldering crater. No one survived the attack. I mean, that's great writing. I mean, Thank you. you could have just been, hey, they were in the house and the bombs dropped and they were done. Um, but the, the writing is, is fantastic there. But can you talk a little bit about him and how that, uh, that mission came about, how they targeted him? He was Georgian by um, nationality. Um, had um, come to the masterminds of 9 11 um, came from many parts of the Middle East where the jails had been emptied and people allowed to travel. And the same thing, um, ISIS attracted um, a rogues gallery of the who's who of bad guys. And he was one of them. He was the military commander, their chief of staff, um, so to speak, um, who was always, um, he, he, was, he, was, he was meant to be an icon of the organization. He had a big red beard. Um, he looked different in many ways than the others. He liked to be photographed. But because he moved in such secretive circles, um, it was very hard to target him. And a lot of these individuals had either been prisoners of or had served in an intelligence or counterintelligence agency, which is why ISIS was so effective, because a lot of the people had military training before they went in. Mm. And then they just took all the lessons that they learned when they beat prisoners to extract confessions. They just took that information and they put it into their um, standard operating procedures. What made the Jordanian operation successful was the fact that tribes or operatives in the GID in Amman could call a counterpart, a relative, someone in the clan who was in Iraq or in Syria and, and kind of say, we're, we're looking for this guy. And out of duty and out of honor, um, that information was easy to obtain because that person in, in the targeted country had resources and business dealings and people spoke. And they had, um, the world was very intermingled, intertwined with individuals. But of course, these are individuals that um, are off limits to, um, to the West. And it wasn't the kind of thing, or there wasn't the kind of information that um, Connex boxes full of cash could buy. A lot of times, these were um, these were assets on the ground that operated by a, a system of loyalty of the desert that we couldn't understand, and the Jordanians could. The Jordanians had their fingers in it, and it was easy for them to find out where certain things were happening using sources. And they were able to get that information back um, to their commanders quickly. And then that information was acted upon quickly by coalition air force, air forces. And I think it's important to, to discuss that operationally um, and tactically, uh, strategically, tactically, and overall operationally. Um, the working together of the Jordanian military and intelligence services and those of this country um, were, in many cases, seamless and very successful. Yeah, I know the way you highlight that in the book is giving, giving me a lot of uh, a lot of good ideas. Um, and there, this one was stood out to me as well. Uh, and you're talking about somebody named Taha Sobi Fahala. I think that's how you say his name, mm -hmm. F-A-L-A-H-A. But uh, you say that he spent six years in the jihadi finishing schools of Camp Buka and Abu Ghraib. Uh, and that, of course, stood out for me because I've been to both places. Um, but can you talk about that as far as those places being finishing schools or maybe other black sites around the world being finishing schools when we're talking about imprisoning certain people that maybe get let loose afterward and end up back on the radar of our intelligence services? 
again, using the analogy of a criminal enterprise. Um, when someone's been in um, Folsom prison, um, in, in the most dangerous block for many, many years, and he's learned all of the brutality and all of the tricks of the trade from all the other prisoners, um, is he rehabilitated? Is he a better person? That's for um, people from a higher pay grade than me, but um, the treatment that these individuals got, either warranted or not, in places like Camp Buka or um, Abu Ghraib, wasn't, um, wasn't designed for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. It was designed for punishment and seclusion from operations that were ongoing. And then what do you do when someone is freed? What do you do when someone escapes? That person isn't going to go and, um, and, and put a night school in, in Baghdad or to Crete and, um, and, and want to open a franchise. Mm -hmm. um, revenge is a very strong motivating factor. And there's only one thing that for years he's learned how to do, and that's hate the West. And that's how to operate and compartmentalize cells and how to be an effective killer. And what, what you've done is you've created a, um, a, a breed of super killers, super terrorists. Add to that that ISIS was incredibly effective in the, in the um, realm of multimedia propaganda mm -hmm. and technology. Store-bought technology that you um, talk on the phone with every day enabled every member of ISIS to be his own propaganda machine. Mm -hmm. And it attracted individuals who, were, um, who felt that they were outside the confines of um, any hope for any different sort of life. And when, when, when an organization um, promises um, the despondent and, and, and the futureless, um, money, a gun, and a wife. Um, you attracted a group of psychopaths and stone cold killers that we ended up fighting. Yeah, and that part's uh, part's fascinating, of course, and we've seen it other places uh, around the world as well. But uh, when we're talking about the Jordanian intelligence service, you bring up something that Alan Dulles said that I hadn't thought about in, in quite some time. But uh, he said, "Never take a person for granted." Very seldom judge a person to be above suspicion. Remember that we live by deceiving others. Others live by deceiving us. So when you're talking about that in terms of, uh, of these operations uh, here um, with the Jordanian intelligence services, how, does that, uh, how did that play in to, to getting this intelligence from, uh, from human sources? We as a nation have individuals who for years have worked in the Middle East. Um, they've been sent there to work at oil companies. They've been sent there to work on human rights um, and NGOs. They've been sent by the State Department. They go to the best schools. They learn Arabic. They live there. It doesn't make them Arab. It doesn't make them Middle Easterners. It doesn't make them a member of that community. And it doesn't give them the nuances of, of language and body movement and slang. And things that um, a Jordanian would be able to tell by talking to an Iraqi that someone at the best um, Ivy League um, Near Eastern centers um, would never know. Mm -hmm. So in and of itself, just that made GID incredibly important in this campaign. The fact that they were very good at their trade, that they were very good at dealing with a host of threats. Because Jordan is kind of at the crossroad, they've, they've had to deal with the Palestinians, they've had to deal with Hezbollah, they've dealt with Al-Qaeda. Um, and they've had just as much experience encountering these individuals as the bad guys have had in trying to penetrate. And that language key, that reliance on, on cultural knowledge is all important. And it's something that can't really be learned. It could be studied, but it, to practice it, you really need to be the genuine article. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, we learned that time and time again over, over the years. Um, and you talk about something interrogations, and this is something that I thought just so much about, um, 
But uh, I'm ready to hear you say in early 2016, the United States initiated a special operation offensive against Islamic State targets in Iraq and Syria. The force known as Expeditionary Targeting Force, or ETF, consisted of top-tier JSOC and CIA special operations units that went after high-risk and top-level Islamic State commanders. The ETF's primary mission was to capture the most important men in the caliphate's leadership and to seize their phones, laptops, and notebooks for intelligence purposes. The ETF consisted of close to 200 men and included safe homes and Iraqi and Syrian Kurdish intelligence officers who could facilitate interrogations and prisoner warehousing so that new versions of the notorious detention facilities such as Abu Ghraib prison wouldn't have to be opened. Old school men, and then I'm going down a little further. Old school masters of the human intelligence game would characterize the methods of such task forces as impatient, hurried, harsh interrogation techniques were frequently employed on the men and women snared in the task force raids. Human rights were abused and individuals were tortured in hastily established holding centers. Then the case of Task Force 626 ultimately produced more future recruits to the Islamic State than actual intelligence on Zarqawi's whereabouts. The part I skipped over was about uh, Zarqawi. Um, so I thought, I think about that a lot. I thought about it in uniform uh, because I was out there actually doing it. Uh, and I think about it today as a citizen, as an, as an author, um, in that line between creating more enemy for your sons, your daughters to fight in the next generation, uh, then you're actually taking off the battlefield. So are you doing more harm than good? First, do no harm. So it's a tough one to wrap your head around, but uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that and uh, on having a task force that's, uh, that, that's focused on doing these things that Israel has done throughout its, its history, of course, and that we got very good at over the last 20 years, um, targeting and taking these people off the battlefield. In the process, perhaps sometimes, making the situation worse. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. So the, um, the old school, talking about the days of me, when terrorists were recruited by um, charm and ideology and adventure, um, interrogations yielded results because the, um, the relationship often between um, the terrorists and the movement was transactional. Mm. Whereas in many of the Islamic groups, the um, relationship is blood, is family. And it, it's something that's important to kind of um, bear in mind um, that the Israelis found in um, dealing with Hamas primarily was that um, cells are made up of blood relatives. And you weren't going to, um, you, you might, um, if you were recruited by um, you know, the, the local um, Indeed job search um, in Ramallah, looking for someone to, um, you know, to blow himself up, um, and you know, strangers came around, you wouldn't you know, mind betraying them. But you're not going to betray a cousin or um, an uncle or a brother. And I think in, um, in the interrogations, and I think that in, in some cases, the Islamic State and others um, use that same model. They recruited blood. They recruited people they trusted. Who do you trust? You trust family. And the, someone in the Shin Bet once commented to me, because um, Israelis used to maybe roughhouse, wink, wink, nod, nod, with their captives. And they found that against the um, fundamentalist terrorists, it didn't work as much, even with ticking bombs, um, people that knew that there was a suicide bomber en route. Um, and explain to me as such, as someone once told him, um, you know, he wasn't afraid of being beaten because he said to the um, Shin Bet um, officer, what are you going to do to me? I have one foot in prison and one foot in the grave. Um, so I, I think that the, the stakes that these people live by and with are very foreign to us. Mm. We always hope for the best. Um, they're hoping for payback. They're hoping for how the organization could um, exact its brand of, um, of, of revenge and how the, um, the, the cause could continue. So... Um, it's important to capture these people. These task forces are incredibly important. But what do you do with the individual? I don't know, but I'm saying, what do you do with the individuals? Um, do you treat them nice and charm them? 
Um, do you do what was done in, in Iraq and, and elsewhere? Um, or are you kind of reserved to the fact that these are who they are? And that one way or another, once they're out in the general population among society, um, they'll do um, everything they can to, um, to continue. There are a lot of programs to de-radicalize individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's, it's a dilemma. And it's a question moving forward that really needs some serious thought. Yeah, what do you think about that, the de-radicalization programs? Because I know there, there are some very prominent people uh, who it's actually worked on uh, and that are, that are out there that, that are, write books and talk and are, and are yeah, I, like to, I like listening to what they, they say because they come from a, a background that is so, so foreign um, to me as far as, hey, I was on one side, they were on another uh, and we we're going to kill each other. Uh, and now this person doesn't want to kill me anymore. Why, why, what was that evolution? Uh, into what they are today. So that part is fascinating. So what do you think about some of those programs? Uh, I, whatever works. Yeah. <laughs> um, whatever, whatever can make it safe to, um, to go to a rock concert in Paris or to be in Times Square or to not be at a fair somewhere in Germany and somebody drive a truck ramming 80 people. Um, that's, that's important. And I, I, I think that... Um, what works is any idea, no matter how bizarre, if it yields results and it doesn't risk people, it's worth exploring. Yeah. 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 It's incredible. Um, and I want to read, this kind of summarizes some of what happened during the time frame of uh, No Shadows in the Desert, which is your, your latest book here. Uh, but it's Robin Wright, award-winning journalist, author, uh, joint fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson International Center. And she writes... History will record that the Islamic State Caliphate, a bizarre pseudo-state founded on illusionary, illusionary goals created by a global horde of jihadis and forced with perverted viciousness, survived for three years, three months, and some 18 days. And then you write, the history of the conflict in the Middle East involving religion and real estate is as old as time itself. The Islamic State will be remembered in the larger scheme of history as a blip, an aberration of human madness that was avoidable in so many ways created mostly by unsolvable inanities and outside politicians who never understood what made the area tick. In the end, it took spies, soldiers, and the combined operations of allied nations to correct the blunders and miscues of the political leaders who let the genie out of the bottle. Once again, great writing. But can you expand you. on that uh, on that a little bit? Yeah, well, um, 200 years from now, is anybody going to remember that... Um that um, a, a group of bearded men in black um, drove stolen um, M1 tanks and, and Humvees and, um, and, and, and other vehicles down the streets of uh, Mosul, um, executing people in, in large pits. Um, who knows what inhumanities will follow? I, I think the, um, the lesson is to maybe not be responsible for the creation of those inhumanities and to sometimes step back and to think about what's the cost of what we're doing, what are the risks, and how could, um, how could a, um, the best intentions create a Guns of August type scenario where the world plunges itself into war. Yeah. And then there's some, there are a lot of lessons uh, in this book as well. Um, and to Jordan in particular, you write in the end here that Jordan is a very special place where history and future merge into a collective mosaic. The country is tribal, yet it welcomes people from all walks of life with open arms. It is a nation that has fought gallantly to protect its interests, yet it has provided shelter and security for refugees from all around the region in need of a safe haven. Jordan is a nation that knows the peril of terror, mostly and mostly the steps that need to be taken to fight it. It has been my great luck to be working in Jordan and with the country's tip of the spear elite special operations unit since 1994. And I'm grateful to King Abdullah for his generosity and kindness. But that part right here where Jordan is a nation that knows the peril of terror and takes the steps that need to be taken to fight it. What are some of those lessons when you spent all this time immersed uh, in Jordan and with the GID and in this uh, this time frame in particular, what are some of the lessons that you think the United States intelligence services and the United States military uh, can take from this portion of history? Well, the, the lesson is, and the stakes for Jordan 
are higher because the um, terrorism that they faced had been internal mm. um, more than they've been external. And also, they've um, what happens in Jordan in most cases emanates, um, originates either in, um, in doctrine, in funding, in the call to arms, or in execution outside the country. So it's facing the manipulation of its own population or people who are inside the country. And the lesson there is that you need to be vigilant at all, um, at every step. Um, you have to be benevolent when you can. And you have to be as dynamic and forceful as necessary to eradicate it once it emerges, and to not um, and to not explain yourself why you're taking action. Um, in the West, there's the disease of why don't they love me, and why don't they understand me. Whereas in this case, for the um, what happened to the pilot, the steps that need to be taken, it's um, you know, world opinion be damned. We have to do. Um, what we need to do. And I think one of the takeaways is that um, as much as I know about Israel and, 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 and its struggles, um, Arabs have been victims of terror um, in far greater numbers. Um, there have been attacks in, in Egypt and in Lebanon where um, it, it's, it's, it's not mutually, um, you know, it's, it's not exclusively something that's exported. Mm. It's something that's um, suffered within. And um, the important thing to realize is communication, understanding, and cooperation among the nations that are kind of enduring this are, are very important. Yeah, no, there's so many lessons here uh, well, in everything that you, that you write. But uh, there's something you write in the beginning here as well that I, that I, that I wanted to read. The changing of fortunes on the battlefield, the coalition's recapture of territory, and the liberation of hundreds of thousands of grateful people from the Islamic State's grip, and the ultimate eradication of the physical caliphate has not eradicated the twisted interpretation of Islam that led men and women from the four corners of the world to travel to Iraq and Syria to become foot soldiers marching toward the apocalypse in the first place. That mindset still exists. It flourishes, in fact. What happened inside the caves of Afghanistan with Al-Qaeda and then in the killing fields of Iraq and Syria were symptoms of a thousand year sectarian war that has raged. The battle lines have placed Sunnis against Shiites, fundamentalists against moderates, and fanatics against all that's Western. The fight has turned the religion inside out, and the conflict does not stop just because the shooting has. The military campaign against the Islamic State is over, but the next phase of the war, where the heart and soul of the virtual caliphate, is about to begin. That's powerful right there. And I, I think it's true. It is, it is most definitely true. And if you're a you know, consumer of the news, like we talked about earlier and you see, Oh, we're out of Afghanistan, we're out of Iraq. I, I think uh, like that sort of a thing. Um, well, just because the shooting has stopped, um, it's not over. I mean, this thing's been going on for a long time. And I think that's, that's one of the, the, the main lessons here as well. I, I, I think a lesson is that, the other side has patience. And it's something that we lack immensely. And that patience can pay off. And I think, sadly, it is paying off for them. Mm. Because instead of them attacking us and dividing us, we're doing it to ourselves now. That. And, and, I, and um, you know, what's the reason, the rationale for doing what they do when we're doing it to ourselves? for free. So um, even if it's on a hiatus, even if it's taking a vacation or it's regrouping um, because of numerous circumstances, maybe even COVID being one of them, um, it's not gone. And all that's needed is a miscue somewhere, an incident that um, without any intention of it becoming a, um, a fuse, um, detonates and then we're back to where we started yeah it's a little little disheartening 
Um, but something else you said there is also disheartening. And it's something that I thought a lot about, especially in writing my, my last book, uh, the devil's hand where I put myself in the enemy's shoes and thought about what they've learned from us on the, over the last 20 years at war. What did they learn from our response to COVID? What did they learn from our response to a uh, summer of civil unrest that it continues in many cases today? And how are they taking those lessons and applying them to future battle plans as they're thinking, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, a hundred years down the line when we're thinking in four year election yep. cycles, eight year election cycles, election cycles for, for our deep thinkers. Um, and, and, the disheartening part of that, as I was writing this book, I had to think, oh my gosh, if I was the enemy right now, I would probably just sit back and watch because we're doing a pretty good job of doing their job for them. Um, so I had to figure out a way to get around that, which I, which I did in that book. But um, my question for you as we wrap things up here is in, you've studied this for a long time, you've been immersed in it for a long time. And uh, does terrorism work? And there are many definitions of terrorism out there, but for, for our purposes, um, we'll talk about deliberately targeting civilians to get a political end out of it. Does, does terrorism work? Have they proven to themselves over the last 20 years, over the last 40 years, even longer, that, uh, that terrorism works, which is why they keep doing it and keep targeting civilians? Does terrorism work? Um, not on the long term. Because ultimately, someone that you've pissed off um, fires a, um, a hellfire missile through your window. Um, on the short term or on the other side of it, um, what exactly is it that they want? Does Hamas think that they're going to destroy Israel? No. But they want to make it as unpleasant and painful as possible, um, as expensive as possible. Um, look at the resources that Israel has to build to, um, to fence in the Gaza Strip. Um, in 10 years, that expense could just be wasted when um, either Hamas comes up with um, different tactics um, or there's peace and you have to take those walls down. Um, does terrorism work? Think of the now that we take our shoes off at the airport for 20 years, almost. Um, think of the cost. Think of the resources um, that have been dedicated to terrorism. So. Terrorism as fear, terrorism as, as political um, theater, very effective. Terrorism as changing the way the world operates, yes. Changing the facts on the ground in nation states, no. Interesting, interesting. Um, and I know you can't talk too much about your next project because it's with, with Fred Burton uh, and you haven't talked too much about it yet, but uh, what are some other projects that you have on the horizon that you'd like to explore in, in the future? Um, well, one of the, the, the one that you, I think you know about that I'm doing with Fred, um, is interesting and it raises moral questions of who we deal with and the stakes at which, um, visions and alliances clash. Um, but so one of the things that I'm going back to is something that is really important to me, um, as a born and bred New Yorker is the NYPD mm. and an incident that occurred that really changed the face of law enforcement in this country um, for the better. And um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll private message you All right. a bit, but um, um, the NYPD to me was always um, fascinating. And, um, and, and I think that what happens in this city in many ways, um, happens ultimately around the rest of the country. Got it. And, uh, you, you know, other than your books, which I encourage everyone to, to read, particularly this, the, the latest one, No Shadows in the Desert, and, but all, all of them, um, it should be in everyone's library who is interested in that part of the world, in terrorism, in foreign relations, uh, the future of terrorism. Um, this should be on everyone's, every student of warfare, uh, of political science. These should, these should be on their shelves, not just on the shelves, but read and highlighted. Um, but aside from your books, what books do you uh, do you wish that some of our senior military leaders or those that are working their way up the ranks or some of maybe our elected officials or some people that are appointed in positions and maybe at the state department or other places, what are some of the books that you uh, wish they would have read or wish they would read in trying to understand that part of the world that you've focused on for so long? I, um, I wish that they would read books that were not written by intellectuals. Mm. Written by warriors, 
written by um, explorers. Um, the notion that you could, well, what did John le Carré say? That the world is a dangerous place to look at from behind the desk. <laughs> I love it. Um, if you read books, for example, that British explorers wrote about Afghanistan mm -hmm. in the 1800s, you can learn more about the region than, um, than the best um, university press topics by PhDs. And I, I, I think that um, it's important to read books that are written by both sides. Mm -hmm. Because in every kind of um, angle of the spectrum, you glean something. There's truth in, in, in everyone's argument, even the bad guys. And to get the perspective to understand is, is important. But the, the short answer to what you, you ask is read. Read, read, and read. Because um, that's, a, um, that's a skill set that sadly is, um, is dying off. Yeah, I could not agree with, with you more. I take every opportunity I can to encourage people to, to read and study and immerse themselves in a topic, especially if they're going to vote, especially if they're going to comment or forward someone else's comment on Twitter or whatever else it might be, because that person has probably also not read and spent the requisite time, energy, and effort by diving into these subjects to really understand the history behind why we're making the decisions we're making or why not. Um, so I try to encourage everyone at every opportunity to, hey, take that breath. And before you just retweet something from someone that has a lot of followers, maybe do some research first. In fact, that that's what you owe yourself, your kids, these future generations. Uh, you owe that time invested because we're only free to be doing these things because people died from the inception of this country up through today to give us those rights. So the least we can do is read a little bit and put some time into the study of these issues rather than just retweeting something because it sounds angry and it came from somebody that, uh, uh, that you follow on one of these social channels. So couldn't agree with you more. And to change it, I would just say that publishers should um, not be worried about books offending anyone and let ideas crisscross um, the, um, the, the space that's in between everyone's ears and let people make their own decisions. Well, that's really timely as well. And I think this next 10 years are going to be uh, quite, uh, uh, well, impactful uh, as far as the future uh, of the First Amendment and, uh, and our freedoms to let ideas percolate out there in the public square so that uh, the best ones hopefully rise to the top, which has really been um, uh, has been really proven from the inception of this country up to today. We can debate these things uh, without fear of having our heads cut off, without fear of being imprisoned. Uh, and now the modern equivalent of that is being canceled, of course. Uh, you know, the equivalent of being burned at the stake is, uh, is the cancel culture that's, uh, that's all around us. So it's, uh, it's a very important time for, uh, uh, for, the, for this nation when it comes to, to those freedoms. So um, I agree 100% with you. And I find it- I'm, I'm of the generation that grew up um, idolizing Don Rickles, and um, poor Don would not be able to be employed um, if he were alive today and performing. Oh my gosh. So let's hope that sanity prevails for everyone. Let's hope so. And I find it interesting when when other authors or uh, artists of any, you know, uh, of any medium uh, are calling for a cancellation of someone else because of an idea or something that they don't like. It's uh, As long as it's not their right. Exactly, idea. exactly. And we all know what happens eventually that comes back to you. That's why we need to study that sure. history, get into these books. Uh, anyway, but hey, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. I sincerely appreciate it. I've been so looking forward to doing this and getting to, that's what I enjoy most about the podcast is being, having an ex excuse to sit down with you because I've read your books. We've gone back and forth uh, on email and talking to each other on uh, direct message and things like that. But, uh, but we haven't had a chance to sit down face to face and talk before. And this gives, this gives me an excuse to put it on the calendar and make it happen. So I hope we can do it in person You're one, one of, of these days. People on the planet looking for an excuse to talk to me, but thank you very much. <laughs> well, I sincerely appreciate everything that uh, that you do i look forward to your next project and uh and thank you so much for your insights just want to take a moment and thank navy federal credit union for sponsoring the podcast and for being a part of my journey throughout the military and today right there that's my navy federal cue card that i got in 1996 right after boot camp so for those 20 years i was in the military 
Navy Federal was right there with me. What I found out recently is that you do not have to be a member of the military to go to NavyFederal.org, check it out and become a member. So check it out, NavyFederal.org. Thank you guys so much again for sponsoring the podcast and for taking such good care of me and my family over the last 20 years in the military and today. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. This gear highlight portion is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Now, Sig has been a part of this journey since well before they knew who I was, as I was taking the Sig P226 downrange and into combat on more than one occasion. And then interestingly enough, just because of those genuine relationships formed over the years, they were curious about what I was going to do as I was getting out and moving on uh, into the post-military chapter of my life. And they have been friends the whole time. And uh, well before I had a podcast, well before I had a social media account, well before I was a New York Times bestselling author, uh, they have been invested in me both as a SEAL and just as a citizen as I was leaving the military. So, uh, to say I'm a, a huge fan would, uh, would be an understatement. So Sig, thank you so much for, for all that you have done and, uh, continue to do for our military and for those who pick up a weapon in defense of themselves, their families, their communities, and their country. So, uh, before I get to some of this other gear here, ball and buck right here, look at that. Bam. Look at their signature Duck Hunter pattern, old school stuff. I love it right there. My friend Mark Bowman started this company a while back and uh, they do great things. So Mark, thanks for what you're doing. Uh, if you ever see me on one of the uh, one of the news shows, I'm usually wearing ball and buck. Uh, see home watches. Look at this thing. So I just had Samuel Katz on the podcast and he's written a couple books with Fred Burton and Fred Burton turned me on to these guys right here. See home watches and, uh, yeah, Fred and Samuel Katz wrote Beirut rules and, uh, they're just great guys, uh, wealth of knowledge between them and uh, very cool watch company. You guys been following me for a while, you know, I'm a watch person. So, uh, so very cool, Fred. Thanks for turning me on to that watch. Let's see. Uh, before I get to some pistols. Look at this. How cool is that? Awesome. So this is a blade I got this weekend when I was at Fieldcraft Survival over in Heber City, Utah with Mike Glover and Andy Stump flew in and we did a leadership seminar, a professional development seminar there. They're going to run a few of those throughout the year. So follow uh, Fieldcraft Survival. They even have their own Instagram for uh, professional development where you can just follow the professional development pieces. But uh, check out Fieldcraft Survival and Mike Glover. He's been a guest on the podcast before. Such a great guy. Love what they're doing over there. They have an amazing team. But uh, as part of that weekend, Trained Monkey sent this blade and it's the Scarface right here. And uh, this is very cool. Look at that symbol. Can you see that? <laughs> I love it. There's the symbol. There's a sticker right there. Super cool. And such a nice note. Um, you guys appreciate it at Trained Monkey Blade Company. Um, Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, the note is uh, sincerely appreciated. And then look at that. They took the time, energy, and effort to do that. Oh yeah, that's cross tomahawks right there. And check out this blade. Look at that. See that in the light right there? This thing is mean. Scarface. I love it. I mean, this thing is, is awesome. So uh, I'll be taking another picture of this soon and putting it on the Instagram with some other things. But wow, what a solid blade. So thank you guys so much. I sincerely appreciate that you know what uh, what a blade means to me. Let's see what else do we have here. Well, here's the uh, 226 right here. So this is the one that uh, that I took down range time and time again over the years. This is a not the exact one, but this is a commemorative edition that Sig made a few years ago. Let's see that right there, trident there. So very cool commemorative 226 um, that uh, most seals took into combat. Uh, from September 11th uh, and forward. So uh, obviously means a ton to me right there. And uh, that is amazing. What's my everyday carry though? I get a lot of questions about everyday carry. And if you've followed me for a while, then you know that I am quite fond of this P365. There's a bunch of different variations of this out there now, the XL, uh, the Spectre Comp. Um, and this thing is pretty sweet right here. So I've been using this and carrying it in black point 
tactical holster. There's a mini wing. I really like the mini wings. Uh, I have a little leather here on the side, so it kind of forms to you a little better right here. And what I love about Black Point Tactical, other than they're they're great guys and have also been on board well before I had a book out, well before I had an Instagram account, certainly well before I had a, a podcast, um, is they were just solid guys that wanted me to test out some of their some of their holsters and uh, and give them some feedback. So, uh, which I did, and I that feedback was that I love these things. Um, so I have, I think I have a Black Point Tactical holster for almost all of my pistols. Maybe there's a couple 1911s that uh, only go into to leather, um, but uh, as far as everything else that I have, I'm pretty sure I have a black point tactical, uh, set up for them. So that's that right there. And I love that it tells me. So if you have more than one pistol and you have maybe, uh, a red dot sight or a, or a, a light or something like that, that goes on there, this tells you which pistol it is. If it's for the red dot version, if it's for the one that has the, uh, the light on it. So that is quite helpful. So thank you. Black point tactical right there. And this is the new one. This is the new one right here. This is the, that Spectre Comp that I was talking about. Um, I need, haven't shot this yet, but uh, by the time this video drops, I probably will have. Um, but this thing is awesome. Look at that. Uh, and look, I don't know if you can tell right there. So it's a little different where you can put the red dot on there from, from previous versions. Uh, but yeah, this thing, awesome. Cannot wait to go give this a run at the range. And uh, because we live in the times in which we do, I will probably take some video of it. And look at this, Surefire sent out this thing. Um, and this is the XSC right here. And so it's specific. It, I love how they made it easy. It even says it on here, P365. So if you have a few different lights uh, <laughs> in, in the drawer, um, this one makes it so easy to figure out what this is for. XSC for the P365, it tells you right on there. And uh, yeah, oh, look at that, bam. Uh, so I had a surefire with me as well on every single deployment. Uh, so I've got to watch how those lights have evolved over time. Uh, I talked about a little bit in uh, the Vickers Guide and the SIG Vickers Guide. There's a section in the middle where I got to be a guest contributor, which was super cool. And uh, talk about the carrying the 226 and then how we had them set up for shipboarding operations after September 11th uh, and how we had those lights on there and just seeing how they have evolved over time is, uh, is, is very cool. So Surefire, thank you so much for this. I'll be uh, giving it a run here shortly. And what's in the pistol? There we go. That 365 ammo right there. V crown optimized for CCW right there. SIG ammo. So this is what I'm, this is what I'm rocking these days. So awesome. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. You can find out more about Samuel Katz at Samuel Katz online and be sure to pick up his latest book, No Shadows in the Desert. It's absolutely fascinating. Then go back and get all his other books as well. You can find me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels. You can go to jackcarusa.com for the merch and official Jack Carr dot com for everything else. My next novel, In the Blood, is coming in hot May 17th. That's a change from May 31st. So it's coming in early. Can't wait to get that out there. Comes out in audio at the same time. So hardcover, audio, ebook, May 17th, 2022. Stand by. So thank you so much for tuning in. I sincerely appreciate it. Until the next time, take care, stay safe, be strong, keep fighting. <laughs>